He is good news indeed. And we, uh, we praise him for the good news that uh, he bestows upon our, our lives. We start off a little bit uh, oddly today. I'll share with you that uh, about a month ago, the, the alarm on our uh, septic system was going off uh, literally all the time, and that is never a good thing. Uh, the, the sound was, was deafening. Uh, there was even a, a bright red light. You can see that just to the, to the left there. There was absolutely no way to ignore the alarm on the septic system. So I begrudgingly pay, uh, call the, the septic system. That's the sort of thing you never want to spend a lot of money on. After assessing things, they, uh, they installed a new pump, and everything has been uh, working very well since. That is, until just last week when the electricity went out. Oh, boy. <laughs> we were out for four days, and i got to tell you, uh, I sweated out every one of them. I so wanted that brand-new pump to be charged with that electrical current, but it was without power. Thankfully, uh, the lights came on, the electric electricity began to flow, and I might say everything else began to flow as well. <laughs> with, uh, with all that in mind, I, I just love the story told of the church that was installing a, a brand new baptismal. To their surprise, uh, as they were installing this baptismal, the, the city wanted them to as, install a septic system. And the pastor was beside himself. Why would we need a septic system for just a baptismal pool? He thought it a bit more, thought about it a bit more, and then figured it was only fitting, particularly because of all those sins that would be washed away. Uh, what a neat image. We established it a, a, a couple of weeks ago in, in talking about my brother Adam. You, you remember Adam. All of us sin just like Adam. There's no getting around it, is there? No, there is a way around it, and God provides a way. We read about that very clearly in our passage for today from 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. It's a great passage about how God offers forgiveness from the sin that so plagues our lives. And of course, we, we know that remedy through Christ. So let's read that passage now from 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We know that we have not come to know him if we, if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what God commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is, is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. So this is God's word for God's people, and may it be a deep and abiding blessing to each and every one of us. Thanks be to God. It is always good to have somebody in your corner. Meredith Burgess was that way for Sylvester Stallone in the movie Rocky. You remember that great movie? You see uh, uh, Meredith right behind Sylvester there. Burgess played the role of, uh, of, of Mickey. He was the one that tended to the corner. In his own way, Mickey always was there for Rocky. He always came to Rocky's defense. Mickey was the one who told uh, Rocky in the, in the, the, the mix of a, of a fight, Rocky, your, your nose is broken. And Rocky asked, how does it look? And he said, ah, it's an improvement. <laughs> you remember that from that wonderful movie. As I said, it's always good to have somebody in your corner. Jesus is that way for us. Jesus comes to our defense. Jesus paves the way for our reconciliation with the Father. Jesus opens the door of, of forgiveness. Jesus is our Savior. 
John writes in, in 1 John, so that we will not sin. That's the intent of him writing. So we will not sin. But if we do, and we will, he is quick to turn our attention to the one who is our advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, our advocate. An advocate is one who helps. An advocate is uh, one who uh, advises. An advocate is one who counsels. An advocate is one who always defends. This notion of an advocate puts us to thinking uh, about what goes on in a, in a courtroom. One who, who stands before a judge uh, does have almost always with them an, an advocate, a lawyer, a counselor. I served on a jury uh, last May. It was a pretty intense case in a, in a federal court. It had a lot of ramifications, not only for the one who is the defendant, but also for our entire community. The defendant was represented by counsel. I thought his lawyer did an incredible job. There wasn't a lot of histronics like you see a lot of times on TV. He was simply there for his client to make a solid defense. On more than a few occasions, the, the, the lawyer would approach the bench, would plead his case before the judge, and on many cases, the judge would acquiesce. The defendant would have been lost without proper defense. Jesus is our defense. He is our advocate. The sacrifice that he made on the cross paves the way for all that to happen. And he now stands as before God Almighty as our advocate, our defender. You see, in God's court, the defender must be without sin. And Jesus is just that. When it comes to sin, God's holiness, God's righteousness demands that sin is dealt with. We need to come to grips with that. God's righteousness and holiness demands that sin is, is dealt with. It's just the way it is. Uh, in, in, in God's holiness, um, he, uh, he, he just can't stand sin, and it must be dealt with. His love, though, provides a way for that to happen. Not just that it has to be dealt with, but in his love, he provides a way for that to happen. Enter Jesus, our advocate. You've heard it said that to err is human, but to forgive is divine. You better believe that. When it comes to, to what God does through his son, Jesus Christ. In God's eye, forgiveness is never done uh, willy-nilly. Forgiveness comes at great cost. It comes with a great price. In effect, God's uh, righteousness, his holiness, demands such. God doesn't just pretend as if sins don't happen. He doesn't turn a blind eye. He doesn't sweep things under the, raw, under the rug. God sends Jesus. And at the center of all of that is the cross. You see, God knows exactly what we need. We need forgiveness at the deepest levels of our lives. No wonder the cross stands as the very symbol of our, our faith. It stands front and, and center as if to remind us of the great thing that God has done in Christ. The cross is the very thing that brings salvation. We, we read it a couple of weeks ago from Romans 3, verses 23 through 25. Hear it again, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through redemption that came by, by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. We'll talk about justification next week and then redemption a couple of weeks after that. Today, though, we, we consider atonement. The atonement of, uh, that, that comes through the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. When it comes to understanding atonement, the notion of atonement for me is a matter of at one That's always been helpful for me to fundamentally understand what 
atonement is. What Jesus did on the cross makes us at one with God, at one man. We become at one with God on account of what Jesus did on the cross. It brings us together with a, with a righteous yet loving God. See how that works? That supreme sacrifice of offering his life on the cross makes it possible for us to, to not only be forgiven by a, a righteous judge, if you will, but one who loves us deeply at every point. You know, this, this stuff of uh, being an atoning sacrifice, it's translated a lot of different ways in, in, in Scripture. One word that's used in the King James Version is propitiation. That's a word that we probably never use. In the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, we, we see uh, the word expiation. Again, another word that we don't, don't use. Essentially, the sacrifice of atonement is, is likened to that of what took place at Yom Kippur, what continues to take place at Yom Kippur, where, where the un, unblemished lamb is, is offered, is sacrificed for the sins of the people. And Jesus is offered for us. But he doesn't just do that passively. He, uh, he gives himself over to God's will. He, uh, he, he suffers deeply there on the, the cross, a sacrifice of atonement so that you and I might have the opportunity to be truly forgiven. The cross is the, the, the very thing that paves the way for you and me to be forgiven and at once reconciled with our Heavenly Father. Again, at one minute. The cross reminds us that uh, forgiveness is not so much a matter of what we do. Sometimes we figure that. that oh, I'll just ask for forgiveness. It's always there. I'll just ask for it. No, the, 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 the emphasis is not so much on what we do when it comes to forgiveness, but what God does. Now, of course, our, our part involves confession, as Ashley talked about last week. Our, our part involves uh, repentance, as Stephen talked about on uh, Ash Wednesday. Our part uh, involves a response of faith, as I, I talked about uh, a, a, a couple of weeks ago. A, a response of faith to the very grace of God offered in, in Jesus Christ, for by grace you are saved through faith. This is not of any works that any of us can boast. All these things involve us, sure. But the real important focus here is on what God does. He does so much more. It involves Jesus and his death on the cross and the greatest show of love that the world has ever known. My good friend Howard Olds once wrote, while the cost of our sin is more than we can pay, think about that, the cost of our sin is more than we could ever pay. The gift of God is more than we can imagine. And indeed, that's the profound truth. More than we can ever imagine. It was that way for the paralytic who was lowered through the roof of the house where, where Jesus was preaching. The man was not only healed of his paralysis, but his sins as well. They were forgiven. It was that, that way for the woman caught in adultery. She was forgiven and told to go and sin no more. And she was not only told that, but she was given the power now to go forward and to sin no more. It was that way for Zacchaeus, the tax collector upon whose house salvation had come. He had been forgiven. He had found himself on the, on the, 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 the outskirts of the religion of his day, and even more significantly, he had found himself outside the bounds of relationship with God because of the things he was doing in his, his injustices to, to those with whom he ex excised taxes. But Zacchaeus had known the forgiveness of Christ. It was even that way for, for Peter, who, as you will remember, denied the Lord three times right before his death. And it wasn't until meeting the risen Christ that Peter was truly forgiven. 
when, when Jesus asked him three separate times, if you, if you love, love me. And in that, Peter was able to affirm, yeah, Lord, you know that I do. And Jesus gives him that, that great commission to, 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 to go and tend the sheep, to feed the sheep. Peter, forgiven of the things he had done. Years ago, Ernest Hemingway wrote a book called Capital of the World. In it, he told the story of a father and son who lived in Spain who were estranged from one another. The boy's name was, was Paco, and he had run away from home and found himself on the streets of Madrid hoping to become a bullfighter, which, quite honestly, without the proper training, would have almost met certain death. His dad, dad desperately wanted to reunite. He knew there would be little chance of, uh, of him finding his son Paco by simply wandering the streets of Madrid. So he, he took out an ad in the, in the local newspaper, which read like this, Paco, meet me in the Hotel Montoya at noon on Tuesday. All is forgiven. Love, Papa. 800 young men, all named Paco, showed up at that hotel that afternoon. The need for forgiveness is that pervasive and is the very reason that God sent Jesus Christ into the life of the world. Through Jesus, God paved the way so that you and me and all the Pacos of the world who find themselves estranged from their Heavenly Father might be forgiven. God never turns away from, from anybody who has the the. The psalmist says in Psalm 50, 51, 17, comes with a, a broken and contrite heart. All of that springs from, from David's transgression. And he, he felt so weighted by that transgression, but yet knew the lift of that weight when God forgives him to the depth of his soul. Thank God that forgiveness is ours in Jesus Christ. Now, as you read through these uh, first six verses of 1 John 2, you would seem that uh, John makes this abrupt shifting of the gears. That happens somewhere between verse 2 and, and verse 3. John, in, in talking about forgiveness, launches into a very robust conversation about keeping God's commands. As I read through those first six verses of 1 John 2, I, uh, I don't see it so much as an abrupt shift of gears. I see it more as a natural flow of going from one thing to the next, of going from forgiveness to obedience. Let's hear what, what John writes here. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what God commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys God's word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in God. Whoever claims to live in God must live as Jesus did, from forgiveness to obedience. Upon being forgiven, we are set free to live as God wanted us to live, not just forgiven, but free, free to obey, free to become more and more like Jesus, which is God's intent with us every time. You remember those bracelets from a few years back? What would Jesus do? WWJD. They were all the craze. Everybody was wearing them. They gave those of us who are Christ followers the opportunity to pause and consider what we really needed to do, to consider those things against the backdrop. Well, what would Jesus do? Those uh, four letters, which represent what would Jesus do, has been more instructive in my life than just about anything. It's, it's given me pause to consider um, what I need to do in a specific situation. How's that been for you? Well, today, let's, let's turn that just a bit against the backdrop of, of 1 John 2, verse 6. 
Instead of WWJD, how about LLJD? Living like Jesus did. Living like Jesus did. That's the way it is for those who are forgiven. That's the way it is for those who are free, free to, to, to then live their lives just as Jesus did and to know the empowerment on the other side of forgiveness that allows us to do just that, free to live just like Jesus did. And all of that begins with that atoning sacrifice that brings us at once together with God, reconciled with Him, so that we might know Him fully, so that we might experience deeply the forgiveness that He offers us. That's the good news of Jesus Christ in our lives. And we exalt in that this Lenten season. And we are thankful for it. And we long to make that a part of our lives. And so as we do, let's take time, time to contemplate all these things, to make sure that that is in place, to seek after the Lord for His forgiveness, to consider the, 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 the cross and all that it means for us, to let God's Spirit work deep within to where we know that we know that we know the good news that is Christ for each of us. Let's pray together. God, we uh, thank you for your Son, Jesus, and for all that you offer through Him. We pray, Lord, that we are always before you, contrite, ready to turn from our selfish ways, ready to seek you in your forgiveness. God, we thank you for your love that makes that possible. We thank you pointedly for the love uh, that you show and share in Christ our Lord. Thank you. Thank you, God, for, uh, for blessing us in Christ, for forgiving us, for making us whole, and for giving us the opportunity to live our lives in him, becoming more and more like him with the passing of every day. This prayer we make in his name, amen. May God be with us all. Church, our prayer rail is 